Chai 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 Art 101 with Mr. Burger. Hello, scholars. Welcome back to Art 101 with me, Mr. Burger. I'm an art educator and a professional artist trying to give you the best videos that I can in the ways of art historical content. And as always, I appreciate the likes, shares, and new subscribers. Easy on the sass, we're just two amigos having a conversation. Comprende? Si lo comprendo. Alright folks, bear with me as we tackle a really big topic, and that is the visual arts connection with communication. As we explore communication, the most direct path to the mind is through the eyes. I would imagine that many of us have experiences with the visual world that are profoundly influenced by the nonverbal language that we would see in the visual arts. This is a language that visual artists use to communicate, and this video is an opportunity for me to give you an inside look at how that communication works. Well, I guess we only got one choice. Go for it. There's a difference between presenting and educating, just like there's a difference between looking and seeing. Looking implies that we are taking in what is in front of us in a purposeful way, while seeing is much more active in the intention of looking. If we only care about something in a functional sense, we just simply need to look at it quickly and have an understanding of what it does. I look at this container and what does it do, what is it for, will it work? But when I get excited about an object that I'm seeing, more times than not we begin to study it and analyze it. We examine it more closely and therefore we go beyond the simple function of looking to a higher level of perception called seeing. You damn right! One of the greats of the 20th century was Henry Matisse and he would talk about this looking and seeing by stating, to see is itself a creative operation requiring an effort. Everything that we see in our daily life is more or less distorted by acquired habits. And this is perhaps more evident in an age like ours when cinema, posters, and the magazines present us every day with a flood of ready-made images, which are to the eye what prejudices are to the mind. The effort needed to see things without distortion takes something very like courage. But hopefully we can recognize that words and visual images are two different languages, two very different forms of communication. Know what I told you ass about that shit? Sometimes as I talk about the artworks in these videos, it's a translation of art that is one step removed from actually experiencing what art really is. And it can better come to life with the witnessing of the actual image itself. The communication that goes on between our eyes and brains is a very unique one. As we develop these connections, we can better understand the advantage of what art has to offer our mind and cognitive development. Ordinary things can become extraordinary when we explore it with our eyes and then our brains. In order to best understand these artworks, we need to understand the components used in the communication. These are all things found in our brain's visual toolbox. The major tools of art are called the elements. This is no different than the elements found on the periodic table in science, as these are the basic components that build everything in art. Generally, I focus on the five primary elements, color, line, shape, value, and texture. Not only are these elements used in two-dimensional artworks, like drawings or paintings, but they're also used in digital artworks like photographs or graphic design, as well as three-dimensional artworks like sculptures. However, with three-dimensional works, the element of mass also becomes relevant. I admire your honesty. Let's look for a moment at Austrian symbolist painter Gustav Klimt's Portrait of Adele Blaschbauer I. It shows his fluid use of several elements from his visual toolbox. The repeated shapes create a flattened depth into the work where the portrait sits. The intensity of the buildup of these shapes 
rectangular and triangular swirling circles and so forth creates a patchwork of different spaces within the artwork. While these are very distinct elements of abstraction, the portrait remains representational and lifelike. Now keep your legs crossed and forget about the real world. Thank you for your time. You know, everything he said was completely relevant, yet somehow it just felt inappropriate. For us to better understand art in general, it will be useful for us to examine, one at a time, each of these key elements that comes from the visual toolbox. What draws my admiration? What is that which gives me joy? Color, as a component of white, affects us directly by modifying our thoughts, moods, actions, and even our health. Psychologists as well as designers of schools, offices, hospitals, prisons, and even locker rooms understand that color can affect our work habits and mental conditions. For example, people surrounded by expanses of solid orange or red for long periods of time often experience nervousness and raised blood pressure. In contrast, some blues are known to have a calming effect, causing activity rates to drop below normal levels. Hello? Hello? Anybody home? Hey! Think with flies! Dressing according to our color preferences is one way we as people express ourselves. Purchasing clothing or cars housewares, and the paint schemes within our homes reflects the importance that individuals place on color, and we as people spend a considerable amount of time and expense determining the colors of the products that we purchase. Most cultures will use color symbolically, according to an established custom. The Renaissance artist Leonardo da Vinci was influenced by earlier European traditions when he wrote, we shall set down for white the representative of light, without which no color can be seen. Yellow for earth, green for water, blue for air, red for fire, and black for total darkness. No thing but a chicken wing on a string. I'm Burger King. The traditional painting of North India, flat areas of color were used to suggest certain moods, such as red was anger and blue for sexual passion. In Australian slang, yellow describes the state of envy or jealousy, while blue means intoxication. Between the 15th and 16th century, color was used in a limited, traditional way in Western art. In the 1860s and 70s, artists were influenced by new discoveries in optics, and at this time, French Impressionists revolutionized the way that we would see color. Most people are familiar with the three primary colors, or hues, red, yellow, and blue. In any art area of study, these colors and others are represented on a color wheel. This was a 20th century concept that was first developed in the 17th century by Isaac Newton. After discovering the spectrum, he found that both ends could be combined into the hue red-violet, making the color wheel concept possible. Numerous color systems have followed since that time, each with its own basic use but the color wheel is generally divided into three parts. The primary colors, which are hues that cannot be produced by intermixing any other hues. Secondary colors, orange, green, and purple. The mixture of two primary colors produce a secondary color. These secondaries are placed on the color wheel between their two specific primary colors that create them. And intermediate hues, red-orange, yellow-orange, yellow-green, blue-green, blue-violet, and red-violet. Each intermediate is located between the primary and secondary of which it is composed. And you'll notice that the primary is always named first. I know what they look like, all right. Color groupings can provide distinct color harmonies that are also known as color schemes. Let's look at a few. First monochromatic is based on variations of value and intensity of a single color, or hue. There are times that I've created works using this idea, but a fantastic example is Pablo Picasso. Hey, 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 just call me Picasso. <laughs> I believe you mean Picasso, Albert. Many people feel that he used blue as a representation of his feelings and has become known as his blue period. A prime example of that is the old guitarist. Analogous color schemes are used on colors adjacent to one another on the color wheel, each containing the same pure hue, such as the color scheme yellow, green, and blue. 
Tints and shades of each analogous hue may be used in the work to add variations to each color scheme. The last color scheme we're going to look at is complementary. This color scheme emphasizes hues that are directly opposite on the color wheel, such as red and green. When precisely mixing these pigments together in equal amounts, they would create neutral gray. But when placed side by side in pure hues, they contrast strongly and intensify one another. The red and green vibrate off one another. Now these examples provide only a basic foundation for color theory. In fact, most artists work intuitively with their color harmonies and are much more complex than the schemes that we're describing here. Bingo! How fun! <laughs> we write, draw, plan, doodle, and play with lines. Lines are a basic means of recording and symbolizing ideas, as it is a primary vehicle for communication. Just like when you're writing your name, you probably also doodle the same kinds of doodles over and over. This is an ingrained bias that is programmed into our minds. Don't be such a wuss, Huffley. Make your move! So as we speak about the elements generally, the line that we create becomes the edge of our creation. The outside edge of something is called the contour. A coloring book page is an example of this. Lines can show motion, be aggressive or passive, indicate direction, define a boundary, create a space, imply a volume or mass, or suggest an emotion. Let's quickly look at some artworks by artists that are using lines in very unique ways. Anselm Riley created this neon work that uses colored lights as lines in this three-dimensional space. Bridget Riley created this powerful energy field of parallel lines in her painting called Current. The current literally pulls our eye through the image. Jackson Pollock's famous work, number one, Lavender Mist, is a buildup of lines by pouring this dripped paint over the canvas using various tools to pour and drip the paint. The depiction of two acrobats in high was created by Alexander Calder. The wires used to create this work create a contour of the acrobats performing a trick in the circus. Now believe it or not, when we boil everything down, there are really two types of lines. When we look at a work like Albrecht Dürer's Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, we see this huge buildup of actual lines. Clearly they are lines that are actually there. But the second type of line is only suggested. These are implied lines. In I and the Village, Marc Chagall uses implied lines to create a large circle in the lower center that brings together the scene of the Russian Jewish village. Implied lines can also be created by a pointing finger or by someone who is looking in a specific direction. The words shape, mass, and form are sometimes used interchangeably, but they can be very different things in the visual arts. Mass is a three-dimensional shape. In the visual arts context, shape is used to refer to the expanse within the outline of a two-dimensional area or within the outer boundaries of a three-dimensional object. I must break you. Now focusing on shape, we can group shapes into two general categories, geometric and organic. Geometric shapes, such as circles, squares, triangles, tend to be precise and regular. Organic shapes are irregular, often curving or rounded, and seem a little more relaxed or more informal than a geometric shape. In terms of shape, another term to know would be biomorphic, which suggests that a shape is based on a natural form. Crystals, honeycombs, and snowflakes aren't really geometric shapes, and they're not really organic shapes, so it's best to label them or identify them as biomorphic. Now going back to Eye in the Village by Chagall, the work uses a lot of geometric structure of circles and triangles to organize the organic shapes of people, animals, and plants. 
he will soften these geometric shapes to achieve a natural flow between the various parts of the painting. Conversely, he obstructed natural objects and subjects toward geometric simplicity in order to strengthen their visual impact in their symbolic context. When a shape appears by itself, it can create a secondary shape of the background area. The dominant shape is referred to as the figure or positive space. The background area is referred to as the ground or negative space. A lot of artists will look at the figure-ground relationships to sort out and interpret what we're actually looking at. Most of the time, our eye is drawn to what is there or the positive space. But sometimes it's critical to also focus our attention on the negative space. As I'm driving down the road and I come up upon a FedEx truck, I'm always reminded of this. We always read the FedEx along that semi-truck but focus in on the negative space between the E and X that creates a negative space of an arrow. This is a design that is legendary among graphic designers. Now there are other ways that the figure ground relationship can be flip-flopped back and forth. As we look at M.C. Escher's woodcut Sky and Water 1, the shifting of the figure to ground contributes to a similar content. In the upper half of the print, we see a dark goose on a white background. As we begin to look down, the white negative space transforms into a fish swimming on a black ground. As our awareness shifts, fish shapes and bird shapes trade places, a phenomenon called figure ground reversal. Don't be a... Light can be directed, reflected, refracted, diffracted, or diffused. As the light changes, surfaces illuminated by it can also appear to change. The range of light from black to white is value. In the terminology of art, value, also sometimes called tone, refers to the relative lightness or darkness of a surface. Value ranges from white through the various grays to black, Many changes in value appear in Michelangelo Caravaggio's painting, David with the Head of Goliath. This style of value is known as curioscuro. It means to use light to add drama. Using oil on canvas, Caravaggio creates an illusion of rounded and sharp edges. On the areas where the light strikes the subject most directly, as we see in the sword, David's chest, and the right side of Goliath's face, these areas appear to be brighter than the background. The details are delicately shaded, showing the artist is sensitive to the subtle details of the face. Some contemporary artists use artificial light as a medium. They enjoy using light because it provides pure, intense color that radiates into the viewer's space. Nam June Paik is a video artist who is known for incorporating an array of neon tubes into his artworks. One such work, Electronic Superhighway, the artist is using neon to tell a deeper story. In his youth, brightly colored road maps and the growing neon tubes that decorated hotels and restaurants along America's newly created interstate system became a part of the All-American Road Trip. Neon was synonymous with adventure in his experiences. The different colors in the work remind us that the individual states have a distinct identity and culture, even in today's information age. In the work, each state is outlined with neon tubes and contains a closed-circuit television feed that gives the state its identity. The 336 televisions, 50 DVD players, 3,750 feet of cable and 575 feet of multicolored neon tubing pay homage to his adopted country. Oh, I like that. That's nice. That's a warm family moment. I agree. We can all learn something from that. Texture refers to the surface quality of the artwork. We often associate texture with the way something looks to feel. We would probably describe something as being rough, smooth, silky, fuzzy, and so on. One example of texture is The Treason of Images by Rene Magritte. The work has a very smooth texture about it. 
In contrast, if we examine Vincent van Gogh's wheat field with crows, the texture is off the charts in the opposite direction. Lots of surface texture, as well as texture intentionally produced with the paint. That's a problem we've all had to face at some time or another. Now that we're informed on some of the tools that are used, how does an artist go about putting them and assembling them together? Sometimes an artist may depict what they actually see in the physical world. They may alter this to some degree, or they may invent an image that no one has ever seen before. The terms representational, abstract, and non-representational are used to describe the work's relationship to the physical world. Representational works literally present again. They are a reconstruction of the forms of the everyday world. There are many ways to create representational arts. A photorealistic artist tries to create a work that absolutely mirrors the real world. Other artists might skew and distort the subjects of the physical world. Modern artist Henry Matisse told of an incident that really well illustrates this point. There was a woman visiting his studio and points to one of his paintings on the wall and says, But surely the arm of this woman is much too long. To which Matisse replied, Madame, you are mistaken. This is not a woman. It is a picture. Now when we talk about something as being abstracted, the verb to abstract means to take away from. It means to extract the essence of an object or idea. In art, the word abstract typically refers to a work that depicts natural objects in a simplified, distorted or exaggerated way. In abstract art, the artist changes the object's natural appearance in order to emphasize certain qualities. Just like there are a million approaches to representational art, there are just as many ways to approach abstraction. But in a basic sense, all art is abstracted because it is not possible for an artist to reproduce exactly what they have seen. Abstraction in one form or another is very common in the arts of many cultures. A great deal of the world's artwork is not meant to be representational at all. Amish quilts, Navajo textiles, and Islamic wood carvings consist primarily of flat patterns that just give pleasure through their lines, shapes, and colors. This non-representational art some may call non-objective or non-figurative, presents visual forms without specific references to anything outside themselves. Do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? Just as we can respond to the pure sound forms in music, we can also respond to the visual forms of non-representational art. While this style of art may seem a little more difficult to grasp, it can offer a fresh way of seeing things. The absence of subject matter actually clarifies the way all visual art forms affect us. Once we learn to read the language of the visual arts, we can respond to the art with a greater understanding and enjoyment. I'm hungry. Let's get a taco. Tell you what, that's a fantastic story. You know where that come from? Watching that damn TV.